if you could tell me your full name. Glenn Elmer Stanson, Jr. And when and where were you born, sir? Holyoke, Colorado, northeast part of the state. And what was it like growing up in the 20s and 30s? I was going to say my birthday is December the 14th, 1925. And it was uh, pretty destitute because when I was born, it was right at the start of the big depression. The banks were going broke. And uh, then while I was a young kid growing up, we had to, the dirt bowl. And we got through that. And after, just as the dirt bowl was ending, uh, the war in Europe was starting. And the United States government, realizing they didn't have an army of any size, started the draft in 1930 40. And uh, pretty much, I went through high school. and in uh, Holyoke, Colorado, and uh, I, gra I graduated in 1943. Um, while I was a senior in the spring of 1943, I, I went ahead and joined the Navy. I was just 17, and uh, it was at the semester I had to get permission to graduate, <laughs> which I did, and uh, because I was long gone while my classmates were finishing school. And how old were you when you joined up? 17. 17. Wow. Um, going back a bit, uh, what was your parents' occupation? What was your job? My dad's occupation? Yes. Uh, he was a mechanic for a time being, and then he uh, uh, went to work for the government in the soil conservation program. And uh, then in 1942, um, things were getting hot in Europe, and my brother, my father here, joined the Navy in 1942, and he was my hero, and that's the reason I wanted to get in the Navy as quick as I could. But he left home, left my mom at home with six kids. Wow. And funny how him. And then, of course, that's me there. Um, it's, then later on, after the war, um, all three of my brothers were in the Army. And where were you when you heard of the Pearl Harbor attack? I was in high school. How did you hear it at the time? Um, I'd been on a morning of Pearl Harbor. I'd been to church. Am I doing okay? Yes, perfect. I'd been to church, or I've been to the church. I did volunteer work to help the janitor, and I would put coal in the furnace to get the church warm, and then go to Sunday school. And um, then I, after Sunday school, this one Sunday, I decided not to stay for church. I went home and got home about 11 o'clock, I guess. Turned on a professional football game on the radio. We didn't have TV then yet. And uh, the, the first thing I heard was that, ladies and gentlemen, the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor. That was the first thing we heard. And uh, I ran back to the church and knocked on the preacher's door on the side and his pulpit was right close. He stepped over and I said, Reverend Hayes, the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor. I think we have a problem with, with our country. And he just, he went in in this congregation to do a prayer and dismissed church that day. And then, of course, during the war, all sorts of things uh, started to happen. And as I say, my dad, joined the Navy in 42, but we had rationing. Uh, Mom had a ration book to get butter, sugar, things like that. And uh, I was uh, 
just a stage where farmers were needing help. And I started in when I was a sophomore in high school, driving caterpillar tractors. And uh, so I was doing, doing a, driving a caterpillar tractor the summer of 1942, just before I went to the Navy. But that was, uh, I don't know if there's enough for you there, Louis, do you need more information? Sir. That's more than enough, thank you. Um, <coughs> could you tell me a bit <coughs> about your training? Pardon? Could you tell me a bit about your training? My training? Yes, sir. I went to Bucat <coughs> in a, at a beautiful lake up in northern Idaho called Lake Pondore. That's French. <laughs> but anyhow, the Navy had had to build a boot camp up there because of the Japanese bombing or the threat of Japanese bomb bombing all the military installations on the Pacific coast. They had to have a, a recruit training station on the west coast, so they built this one up Farragut, so Farragut, Idaho, and that's where I went to boot camp and then boot camp there and then uh, you sign up for schools or you hope you're going to get the school you signed up for and, and of course they test you you have aptitude tests and uh, I don't know I, I know that I did not pass the test uh, for diesel engineering because my math wasn't very good <laughs> but uh, so they put me in where I needed, really needed math. They put me in the medical corps. So I was trained as a corpsman in the Navy. And uh, corpsman in the Navy, uh, Lordy, all of the different duties, we could be assigned to the Marines to be first aid, the first aid team with the Marines to the invasion of the islands or we could serve in a hospital as ward attendants, or we could do as, uh, my first job in a, as a hospital corpsman was taking care of what I call extreme psychopathic patients that they couldn't handle in a regular hospital situation. I, they were under my supervision in the, jail, in the brig, the jail, and uh, that could be pretty violent, and some of the people I had, uh, different patients had different things, and uh, then they sent me over to, um, this was Naval Hospital in Seattle, Washington. Then they sent me over to Gonzaga University, uh, where we had a medical clinic for an officer training school and I was stationed there with three other corpsmen for 10 months and at that as corpsmen there, uh, we, we did all of the, our own medical work because we didn't have a doctor. And so we were well enough trained that we could do our work without the help of a doctor other than surgery. And uh, so a guy came in with a rash we do the blood test, test it. Oh yeah, you got measles or something. And we did all of our own laboratory work, all that kind of thing. And then uh, I was uh, transferred to the to the hospital ship uh, called the USS Tranquility. Uh, that's anyhow. There's a picture of the oh, those are all the same. That's better. With that's a picture of the hospital ship. Oh well. Yeah, it's a large ship then. It's what? It's a very large ship. Yes, we had we had the capability of, of uh, 
600 patients are wounded men and uh, we were sent in the Pacific then theater and uh, we were in Okinawa during the invasion and fight of Okinawa and our ship would have we would be totally loaded with 800 patients and uh, one point got pretty hairy one night we were in a type nasty typhoon <coughs> excuse me and uh, we thought was we were afraid of our ship was going to roll over if we'd have rolled over too far we'd have gone down with all 800 of those wounded kids including ourselves uh, I'm not ashamed to tell you people I had been a, as a boy I'd grown up gone to church Sunday school and all that and uh, was it you know a, a flaming Christian if you want to call it but that night I laid in my bunk with my eyes closed and I prayed and I said God I'm yours forever and uh that was my, my thing that night. Then later on, we went down to the anchor, big anchorage where we were getting all of the Marines inoculated with shots for the oriental diseases like yellow fever and that. And uh, we were the hospital ship for the whole for the whole fleet in the anchorage. And. Um, getting ready for the invasion of Japan. But we get this message one night. It says, we were to proceed down to the island of Palau. And we were to begin to receive the kids off the USS Indianapolis. <coughs> <coughs> it was the last ship sunk during World War II. And historically, <coughs> historically, it, it carried the atomic bomb um, from San Francisco to Tanian, where the, it was given to the super forts that eventually bombed Japan. Well, after they left the bomb off, they were gone to the Philippines. <coughs> I'm running out of gas here. But, and uh, everybody, the higher officers in the Navy, they thought that Indianapolis was going to go up north and join Admiral Nimitz. Another group thought they were going to the Philippines. And uh, they never were told there was a Japanese submarine lurking in the Philippine Sea. And of course, the Indianapolis got nailed. And they lost over a thousand men. And there were 900 men that were saved out of that. I mean, they cut off the ship. Out of that 900 men, 317 were saved. And we ended up with, on our ship, we ended up with 167 of them. Which, from, the, from when we got them, we took them to the island of, of Guam. And they were, again, they were... This is a picture of where we were unloading them in Guam. It's not very plain. Not the, yeah. But we were unloading them at Guam and their survivors off the Indianapolis and we on our ship. We did not know the atomic bomb had been dropped. They took, even though they took it over there, the secrecy was so strong. The secrecy was so strong that uh, nobody knew. Uh, those 
crew people or our crew. Ooh. <coughs> <coughs> oh, I'm drawing on your tape. No, no problem. Uh, so um, those kids, like I say, we took them to Guam. From there, we took off and we joined the fleet then up off the coast of Japan and we were ready for the invasion of Japan. So we were sailing back and forth. We were ready for the invasion of Japan when Emperor decided that he better call it quits. And one of the things that I point out is that even though the, the atomic bomb is blamed for causing the war to come to an end, which was it was very strong in, as a deterrent. Uh, the, the Air Force with their super bombs were dropping fire bombs on the islands of Japan and Tokyo. The city of Tokyo was already fire bomb half flat. And the Emperor knew that was going to happen to all those Japanese cities. They were going to get bombed with fire bombs before we put him in on the island. And uh, so he called he called it off and and of course after that I got to come home. I was discharged, I went to college at Greeley and became a teacher and a coach. And uh, I taught for my, most of my years I taught down in Rocky Ford, Colorado, Ellen country. <laughs> so that's incredible. Um, <coughs> I've got a few questions related to your time still while you were in the Navy. Um, I, I was called a pharmacist mate second class when I... Okay. Um, okay. I, I was wondering, um, like, sorry, give me a quick second. Did, did the survivors of the USS Indianapolis ever talk to you about the accident? I went to a few of their uh, reunions. Uh, they had, they liked to come to Estes Park about every third year for a mini reunion, they'd call it. And when they did that, I would take off and go up and get with them. And I got to know some of those guys pretty well, yes. And uh, the last the last survivor of the Indianapolis died last year. Um, what condition were they in when you when you rescued them? Or, what condition was I in? No, when, when were the survivors in oh, when you took them onto your ship? I, I can't, uh, it's hard to describe. Because they'd been in this salt water for four and five days. And the guys, in the smaller boats, but you know, if you, the big ships couldn't get close to the survivors because we'd swamp them drowning. So they sent the smaller boats up there and uh, some of the rescue guys said they'd grab those guys to pull them on board and they, their skin would just slip up. A lot of them, a lot of them committed suicide uh, when they saw rescue ships coming because they thought that they were the Japanese coming back. Uh, so they were in very good shape and they got on our ship and they couldn't eat solid foods so my job was uh, I was the chief di dietitian in the medical because it, doing special diets it's like a, a prescription you, you doctor prescribes it you do that that's not the regular food and so my job on the hospital ship was those special diets. And all those kids, <laughs> all 167, were getting a lot of custard and soup for a few days. <coughs> How long did it take until you got used to working with wounded soldiers? Did it impact you at first? You know what? Did it impact you at first working with these wounded soldiers? Did it impact you at first working with these wounded soldiers? Like. Was it difficult? No. No? No, you... You know, coming through the depression and one thing or another, and, and uh, you have a little different attitude and that of life. Uh, it's being in the service and take care of those guys, wounded guys, the sick guys. <coughs> 
it was uh, it was your job, just like job here on the street, uh, and uh, it was dangerous. We all knew it was dangerous, but it was also a job, and it was a job that had to be done, and we we did it. Um, did you feel a sense of camaraderie with your fellow crewmates? Oh well, yes, my uh, and of course. Yeah, here in Colorado, I only knew one other crewmate that was close. He lived up in Nebraska, and I would go and visit him until he died. And uh, he was, he himself was a survivor off the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. He, the only reason he was alive, he got blown off the ship. And so he was my buddy on the ship, and years later, all through, till he did die, yes. And what were your impressions of the Pacific Theater, having visited places like Guam and the Palalu Islands? Well, those islands, if you got a ukulele and can send the music to the Danan Ho, they're pretty, they're beautiful. But then we also have to remember the hell that took place on these islands, you know, um, Louis, we we have the European history and the big fight in Europe, Germany. But every one of those little island invasions was a was a D Day in itself. I mean, it was horrible. We lost a lot of men. We lost uh, I, uh, I forget the number of casualties that we lost at Iwo Jima, and then the number of casualties at Okinawa. And if the American people would have known what was going on in the Pacific, they might have been upset and demanded we get out of the war. Um, Admiral Nimitz had such strong censorship coverage, the press couldn't say, press people, the newspaper people couldn't say much. And uh, so that was, uh, I don't know whether that answered your question or not. Yes. But, uh, you yeah, know, I enjoyed my service life. I enjoyed serving my country. And uh, as I say, but my day-to-day -day job that I had to do was just a job. And, uh, Did you feel resentment towards the Japanese? What? Did you feel resentment towards the Japanese? Um, there's a difference between the American Japanese and the Japanese at that time. And uh, uh, now today, I, oh, I, as a Christian man, I, I profess a love for all people. But in my teaching and coaching, I had some fantastic Japanese boys play for me. And I loved every one of them. In fact, I had a lot of Hispanic boys. I, was, they, I still get phone calls and, and letters from them, and uh, I enjoy them. I go to their reunions. Um, let's see. Um, what medical cases were the most common on, on the ship? Pardon? What medical cases were the most common well, uh, stateside in the hospital, uh, you know, common things like pneumonia and, and uh, kidney problems, kidney disease. But then out in the Pacific, most of the problems were wounds. Guys shot. And, or there were those like off the Indianapolis that had been in the water that had water problems. It's, but at the remember, hospital ship, we were there to serve the wounded, and that's what we would have. What were the most difficult cases to deal with? Oh, I, it's hard to tell this one, Louis. Most, 
difficult case I personally ever had to handle was <coughs> was uh, they were bringing a young man back from down in Australia to the United States for court martial because he jumped ship. He was AWOL and he jumped ship again and they caught him down in New Zealand while they were bringing him, and this, this is hard for people to understand, but it does happen to people. They were bringing him back to the States and somewhere out there in the Pacific on his ship, they were bringing him back. His mind went like that. And he was, he would go je jellyfish. When I got him in the brig, he couldn't, they couldn't, he couldn't be on a bed, a bunk, right? They, he had to lay on a blanket, and I had to feed him like a baby. Mush, stuff like that. Take care of him like he was a baby. And, uh, but his mind snapped, it never did come back. And uh, that was 